Hey there, I pray this video encourages you and helps you grow and become more like Jesus. Follow along with the notes linked in the description. And don't forget to hit the subscribe button. Enjoy. Well, good morning. If you would, open your Bibles to the book of Acts, chapter 9. We're actually going to see some ripple effects of the life of Jesus today and a ripple effect of the gospel moving through the church through miracles. Today's message is entitled Peter's Miracle, Miracles Ministry. And I want to uh, just give you a heads up up front that we're going to respond today to this scripture. So if you physically are dealing with something emotionally, spiritually, mentally, whatever it may be, we want to pray over you. So uh, let's not get too comfortable and be ready to respond today in worship and in prayer. Sound good? And I'll try not to go so long so you don't get so comfortable. <laughs> Acts chapter 9 and we'll be in verse 32. Warren Wearsby, the pastor, famous pastor, wrote a lot of great books on the Bible. He asked this question, what is the greatest miracle that God can do for us? Some would call the healing of the body God's greatest miracle, while others would vote for the raising of the dead. However, I think the greatest miracle of all is the salvation of a lost sinner. Why, he says, because salvation costs the greatest price. It produces the greatest results and brings the greatest glory to God. It's a good word. And it's true. Salvation secures heaven, not just physical healing. So a brand new body. Who wants a brand new body? I know I would like one. I got some requests too, you know, for that now. And Peter was a leader of the church in Jerusalem. And now that Paul has been transformed and no longer persecuting the church, there's peace and the Holy Spirit is thriving. And by the way, did the Holy Spirit work even in the midst of persecution? Yes. So whether there was conflict or peace, the church keeps spreading. But now with Paul um, saved as well, the church just starts expanding and Peter comes in and he actually visits in different areas and he's on an itinerant uh, ministry mission. He's kind of traveling around towns outside of Jerusalem. So now he's in Judea in our text today and he is preaching the gospel. He's having uh, demonstrations of the gospel. Just so you know, the ministry of the gospel is preaching of the word, signs and wonders and miracles and casting out demons. And so this is the sign of the gospel being preached and going about. And this is what Peter does in our scripture today. And he's covering Judea, which Acts 1.8 says that the gospel will go to the ends of the earth from Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And so here we have Peter about to perform two miracles and he's in Lida and Joppa where he demonstrates the power of God through these miracles. And what's interesting is, is Joppa is actually where Jonah ran to, to leave God's command. Remember that? So let's pick up in verse 32. Meanwhile, Peter traveled from place to place and he came down to visit the believers in the town of Leda, where he met a man named Aeneas, who had been paralyzed and bedridden for eight years. Peter said to him, Aeneas, Jesus Christ heals you. Get up and roll up your sleeping mat. And he was healed instantly. That's it. But we, over, we complicate it, don't we? I do wonder, though, if Peter knew this was going to happen. I do wonder if he had a word of knowledge, so to say, to, to know that. Or was Peter so full of the faith that he just said, get up, Jesus heals you. Notice he says, Jesus heals you. He didn't say, I heal you. Jesus heals you. And this is re resembling the, the life of Jesus. Jesus did this multiple times where he told a person to get up, pick up your mat, and the person was healed. Then the whole population, or other translations say many in that town of Leda and Sharon, saw Aeneas walking around and they turned to the Lord. They turned to the Lord. Verse 36 says, there was a believer in Joppa named Tabitha, which in Greek is Dorcas. 
She was always doing kind things for others and helping the poor. About this time, she became ill and died. So even good, godly people die. Even good, godly people get sick and die. Her body was washed for burial and laid in an upstairs room. But the believers had Peter, but the believers had heard that Peter was nearby at Lida, so they sent two men to beg him, please come as soon as possible. Well, this is really interesting. They prepare the body for burial, but they put it in an upstairs room. Preparing the body for burial would be custom, but to put it in an upstairs room would, would not, because if the person was dead, then you would keep them on the bottom floor, preparing them for the tomb or wherever the gravesite would be. They had so much faith that they reserved her body, didn't anoint it with oil yet, it reserved her body, preserved it, so to say, upstairs. And they said, let's find Peter. That's some faith right there. They believed that Peter could change the circumstances and believe that perhaps Peter would raise her from the dead. Wow. So Peter returned with them. He was found. And it was only about... Uh, 12 to 20 miles away from where he was. So Peter returned with them. And as soon as he arrived, they took him to the upstairs room. The room was filled with widows who were weeping and showing him the coats and other clothes Dorcas had made for them. But Peter asked them all to leave the room. Then he knelt and prayed, turning to the body. He said, get up, Tabitha. And that was it. And she opened her eyes. When she saw Peter, she sat up. He gave her his hand and helped her up. Then he called in the widows and all the believers and he presented her to them alive. I want to read this one more time, verse 40, because if you read it fast, you can miss something. But Peter asked them all to leave the room. Then he knelt and prayed. Sometimes it takes prayer and fasting before you do the miracle asking the Lord for guidance and wisdom and power and faith to do. We don't know what he prayed, but perhaps he prayed for all those things. He took the time to send everyone out and he prayed. And he says, get up, Tabitha. Verse 42, the news spread through the whole town and many believed in the Lord. And Peter stayed a long time in Joppa, living with Simon, a tanner of hides. And we'll learn more about Peter in Joppa later on in this series. Wow. Tabitha was well known in the community for good deeds and loving kindness, taking care of widows and providing clothing for those who are poor. She was an amazing woman of God, so much so that they grieved over her loss and begged Peter to come and to do something to help her. This pity shows that they still need her in their life, but most of all, that she made a, a lasting impact in their life through her love. There was an urgency that Peter was to quickly come and to be there, but he slows down to pray and ask for God's guidance, most likely, and just for the miracle to take place. Peter's ministry mirrors our Lord's healings and miracles Jesus healed the crippled man who was lowered down through the roof on a mat. Remember that? Jesus healed the man at the pool of Bethesda who had been crippled or lame for 38 years. And he said, get up and pick up your mat. Jesus heals a paralyzed servant in Capernaum in response to a centurion's faith and never even went to that servant and never touched the servant. And that servant was healed. And Jesus heals a woman who had been crippled for 18 years. Jesus raises a widow's son from the dead in Nain. In that story, Jesus goes up to the coffin and touches it and the boy comes back to life. Jesus raises Jairus' daughter back to life, which is very um, prominent healing. It's mentioned in three of the gospels. And Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. And now Peter's doing similar things a reverberation, a ripple effect of the gospel being preached that we can preach the gospel 
We can perform miracles in his name and we can cast out demons. Matthew 8, 14 through 17, it will be on the screen for you. If you have your Bibles, turn to it. The reason why I believe, uh, first of all, how many, how many know that Peter has the, the gift of healing? Obviously. And he's got a, pr- a prophetic ministry because he preaches as well and speaks for the Lord. But I think uh, as well that, you know, healing was close to home to Peter. Matthew 8, verse 14 says, when Jesus arrived at Peter's house, Peter's mother-in-law was sick in bed with a high fever. But when Jesus touched her hand, the fever left her. Then she got up and prepared a meal for him. That's great. What a day. They probably feasted. That evening, many demon-possessed people were brought to Jesus. He cast out the evil spirits with a simple command and he healed all the sick. This fulfilled the word of the Lord through the prophet Isaiah, who said, he took our sicknesses and removed our diseases. Isaiah 53, verse four. So what we see here is as part of the gospel ministry is not just salvation through the preaching of the word, but Jesus came to heal the sick and to cast out demons. And there would be a a very particular purpose for these signs. So let me show you that. The purpose of divine healing and miracles or miracles in in general, signs, wonders, miracles, all of them together. What's the purpose of that? Let me show you a slide for you. God heals out of his compassion for us. Now, if you're not healed, does that mean God doesn't have compassion on you? No. In his sovereignty, he heals. He heals and some he doesn't. But here's the promise for all of us. When we get to heaven, we will all have a new body. There won't be a worry about that at all. And what's more important than anything in this world is that we are saved through Jesus Christ. What a blessing it would be to experience a miracle. I know some of you have, some of you have been healed in those things but I am, I am at peace that if I were to pass away through some kind of sickness or something like that, whether God wants to do a miracle in my life or not, I know where I'm gonna be. And I have peace and I'm not gonna have, if I'm healed from back pain or something like that, you know what? When I get to heaven, I'm not gonna have allergies. Come on, praise the Lord. Thank God. I won't have fears or anxieties worry. I won't have anything. I'll never cry again about anything. You see what I'm saying? There's peace, everlasting peace. So remember to keep your eyes on the future, not just the temporal or the present. Keep your eyes on the future when it comes to God and why he does what he does. Secondly, God heals to provide a foretaste of what's to come in the kingdom of heaven. He wants to show that his kingdom in heaven is on earth. And so he heals people and he heals people even through us. Remember, Ananias was not a apostle last week and God used him to heal Paul. He was an everyday believer. God heals so that he may be glorified so that people will see God, he heals. God heals to convince the unbelieving audience that the gospel is true. And lastly, God heals that he may convict men of their sinfulness to repentance and salvation. He did that in these two stories. Aeneas was healed, Dorcas was raised to life, and both towns came to Jesus Christ in salvation. That's the purpose for healing. The purpose is larger than just the compassion for you to be healed from your sickness, but I believe the Lord wants to heal your body and heal you or heal people that you're gonna pray for so that he would be glorified and so that they would see their need for salvation and turn to Jesus Christ. Amen. Sometimes people need to see a miracle to be convinced. But I do love the words of Jesus when he said, blessed are you who have not seen me and you still believed. Maybe not seen a miracle and you still believed. 
healings and miracles are done by faith in the Lord. I'm gonna break this down in two parts. Healings and miracles are done by faith. And then I'm gonna say, I'm gonna teach by faith in the Lord. Healings and miracles are done by faith. The Bible teaches three points of contact for healing and faith is involved in all of them. Number one, the faith of the one being healed. Do you remember the bleeding woman who pushed through the crowd to touch the hem of Jesus' garment? She believed that if she did that, she could be healed. But then you have the centurion who believed for his servants. And so he came and approached Jesus and by faith, and it was a beautiful demonstration of faith where he tells Jesus, I'm in charge of people too. If, if I say go, they go and they do what they need to do. And so the, the centurion said, I know that if you say he's healed, he will be healed. Wow, that's faith. That's trust. And so the servant was healed. And so it was the centurion's faith for the person sick. So you can have faith for someone today and they could be healed and they don't even have faith. That's a misconception that we think that they must have faith. No, there's times where you intercede for other people to be healed. And then hopefully we trust and believe that that healing is gonna open their hearts to believe in Jesus for salvation or if they're a Christian to encourage them to stay strong in the Lord. And lastly, we have the faith of the healer. Peter had faith for Aeneas. Aeneas did not have faith in it. We have no mention of it. Peter, Peter uh, spoke to the man at the gate. Pastor Brandon preached this in Acts chapter three. The man did not demonstrate any kind of faith. He actually wanted money. And Peter instead gives him a healing through Jesus Christ. So there's three ways. And, and by the way, obviously Jesus can heal, right? He's, he's fully God, fully man. He's a He's, he has power to heal, so he's gonna be able to do that. But even we can have faith for someone else as the person who's gifted with healing. Not everyone has the gift of healing, just so you know, okay? And not everyone needs to have the gift of healing. You wanna know why? Because we need you to have the other gifts too. We need to be a balance of the body of Christ. Some will be the hand, the feet, the mouth, the ears. Is there toes? Maybe there's toes, I don't know. Probably the feet the back, the heart. We need all of that, but no one's the head. Only Jesus is the head. Obviously, this is a metaphor for the body of Christ, not meant to be taken literal. But we need each other and we all need different giftings. And so some people are gonna be gifted with the ability to heal. But I will say this, can we pray for someone to be healed and God chooses to do that? Yes, absolutely. Even if you don't have the gift of healing. Now we need to have faith in the Lord. So healings and miracles are done by faith in the Lord, not your ability. Not your power, but his power, his might, his spirit. It's not done by yours. And we're not putting our faith in our ability, but in Jesus because he is the healer. Jesus is the healer, not the physical means by which some healings occur. It's not how someone is healed, it's who is doing the healing, which is Jesus. And I believe this is an important distinction because some, some of us put healings in a box as if they always have to happen the same way, but this is not the case. Some of us have been fooled by the idea that if I buy that handkerchief online for a slow cost of $9.99, and it comes to my house and I touch it, I will be healed. Some believe that if we buy special oil from a well in Israel that, and we put it in jars and sell it for $50 and put it on people, they will be healed. The power is not in the elements. The power is in Jesus Christ. It's really important that we understand that. Now, could God use something like that? Yeah, because he's God but God doesn't always heal the same way either. I recall years ago, uh, a woman in our church, a, actually a, um, a young woman, someone that was helping me out in youth ministry and was married or getting married. She told me that she has cysts on her ovaries. 
And um, it was Friday when I called to pray for her on the phone when I found this out and um, I wanted to pray for her and her operation was gonna be on Monday. And as I'm uh, talking to her on the phone about her whole situation, the Lord said to me that when they open her up, they're gonna find no cysts in her body. Now I decided to tell her that because I definitely had a word from the Lord that was so much conviction that I just said it by faith as well, but also with confidence because of what I just was whispered to my, to my spirit from the Lord as I'm on the phone. It's hard to explain, but you just know you're supposed to say it. And if I was wrong, then so be it. And so I said it and she calls me Monday afternoon after the meds have wore off and she says, Ryan, it was exactly as you said. They were still there before they opened me up, they're gone. I'm healed. Now she has two children married and living here in Delaware. Yeah, praise God. I did not expect that because I always thought I need to go to the house or the hospital and lay a hand on her and, um, and, and pray for her. And instead, God did it over the phone. And uh, twice now that we've prayed for healings, or at least, I'm sorry, that I prayed for healings, it was like God had already told me it was gonna happen. You may recall Jenny Cox's story where she was over here worshiping about a year ago in January, and I was over here worshiping, and the Lord said, today is the day she will be healed. I went to go pray for her. I knelt down to pray for her, and she said, I'm healed. I said, oh, okay, <laughs> praise the Lord. She just knew she was healed. Her body no longer hurt and she's been healed ever since. It's been a verified healing in this church. Praise the Lord. And uh, um, she was healed while worshiping. No one touched her. We cannot put God in a box, can we? There's one more lesson, uh, important lesson from the scripture though that I wanna make sure we, we grab onto here because using the gifts of the Holy Spirit are, are powerful things. But there's one thing here that if we read this again too fast, we miss, and that is the love of Tabitha or Dorcas. I believe her love set up a miracle. Her sacrifice to the widows of this town and her making the garments and loving those around her, it prompted those people to go find Peter for a healing for a miracle. And so my friends, love goes a long way, doesn't it? Love softens the hearts of the people. And we don't know their salvation story in this town. We don't know if some of these women were saved yet. But what we do know is because of Tabitha's love, showing love, and then an amazing miracle through Peter, the whole town or many in the town came to be believers in the Lord. So my friends, we should love one another. And what good is it to have gifts, but not love too? In fact, 1 Corinthians 12 discusses the gifts to the church. 1 Corinthians 14 discusses how to operate in the church body with decency and order. But guess what 1 Corinthians 13 is right in the middle, love how we should love one another. Love is patient, love is kind. And without love, these things are like a resounding gong and a clanging cymbal. It's just noise. It's not, it's not Christ-like. So do not underestimate your love because your, your love is setting up the stage for God to use the person who has the ability to do miracles or healings or words of knowledge and wisdom and all those things that come in and to do their part, or it may be you when you discover what your gifts are. How do we discover our gifts, by the way? I have found that I've, I have discovered my gifts by serving the Lord and walking by faith and being a disciple of Jesus, not by sitting on a couch. And I don't mean that like in a, in a mean way, I'm just being honest. Uh, yesterday was beautiful. We had 30 people back here learning about their finances in our connect room. And then we had about 20 people going out in the community, if I'm mistaken, Pastor Cornelius, around 20. 
It was pouring down rain, cats and dogs. My windshield wipers couldn't keep up at some moments. And, and here we are, and we're going into the towns to share the love of Jesus Christ into our towns. And we were at, we were at Starbucks, and we were at stores, and we were at the mall, and uh, it was beautiful. And I hung out at Starbucks with two of our members, and we, we talked about the Lord. And by the time we left, we talked to eight people about Jesus. We gave away four of our Bibles that we had left over and we invited people to church. And praise the Lord for that. God is gonna use those things. Yeah. But I share that to say, it was in those moments where the Lord was using our gifts. So love and use your gifts. And lastly, uh, offer prayers and faith. All we can do is offer prayers and faith. So I wanna to turn to the book of James, James chapter five. If you have your Bibles, you can go to that as well. We'll have it on the screen too. James chapter five, and we'll be in verse 13. The title uh, of this section of scripture is the power of prayer. Are any of you suffering hardships, you should pray. Sounds good, right? Are any of you happy? You should sing praises. That's what we were doing today. So in the, in the church body like this, we could have people who are not feeling well or going through hard times and we can have people that are, are doing well and they should sing praises, right? And we should all give God glory and praise, right? But there's times where people are in need and so we should slow down and pray as well. Verse 14, are any of you sick? You should call for the elders of the church to come and pray over you, anointing you with oil in the name of the Lord. So we have oil down here. We're ready to pray for you as, as pastors and leaders, as well as the prayer team members. And he says here, such a prayer offered in faith will heal the sick and the Lord will make you well. And, and this is separate, and if you've committed any sins, you will be forgiven. And how would you do that? Verse 16, Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. So there's spiritual healing that needs to take place and physical healing that needs to take place. I remember a story where Warren Wearsby, and can you connect these two together? Well, there's arguments over that. If someone's sick, does that mean um, that they're sinning and such? Well, there are some connections in the Old Testament where David needed to repent and because he wasn't, his bones and things were aching and hurting and he needed to make things right with the Lord. And as soon as he did, he felt better. But Warren Wearsby tells of a story of a woman who went through some serious trauma in her life and, and uh, she went to every doctor because she had physical issues in her body and none of the doctors could figure it out. Every test came back negative. She was healthy as can be. And so the doc, this is decades ago. So this is when doctors would recommend you go to your pastors. And maybe you do now. Thank you, Christian doctors for doing that. But they had believed that there might've been more of a psychology struggle here or a spiritual struggle. So a Christian doctor recommended that she go talk to her pastor. And so she did. And there was a word for her that she had been holding on to unforgiveness and bitterness towards someone in her life. She went home and she gave that to the Lord. And when she gave it to the Lord and forgave that person in just privately in her own heart, all of her illnesses went away. That was a struggle for her. So it could be that we are wrestling with something like that emotionally or physically or mentally because there's something that we need to turn from. That is a possibility. But the, this scripture here is encompassing both physical and spiritual well-being. He wants you to be saved and healed. He wants you to be saved spiritually and he wants you to be healed physically. The word sozo is here for both physical healing or spiritual healing. Okay, it means deliverance. And it says this, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results, amen? Offer up a prayer of faith. Just believe the Lord can take care of this situation. Years ago, this is from Thomas Trask, who used to be the general superintendent of the Assemblies of God, 
says this, years ago when my father was a board member at the Assembly of God in Brainerd, Minnesota, there was a man named Wally Johnstone who had a hideous cancer on his lip. The cancer had been removed, but had grown back. The doctors told Wally that the cancer would progress down to his throat, to his jugular vein, and then he would die. Johnstone, a new Christian, was reading James 5, 14. I love the, like, the new, the, like just the innocent new Christian heart. He reads it like, you know, literally, right? He called the pastor and said, pastor, get the deacons over here and pray for me. <laughs> he read what we just read. He's like, get the deacons over here. Get, get the elders, let's pray. The pastor called my father and said, Waldo, I want you to get the deacon board together and meet me at Johnston's house. When they arrived, Wally said, I was reading in James that if anyone's sick, he needs to call for the elders of the church who are to anoint him with oil, pray the prayer of faith, and the Lord will raise him up. I've done what the Lord had told me to do. I call for the elders. Now you men are going to anoint me with oil, lay hands on me, pray the prayer of faith, and the Lord is going to heal me. That's faith. And, and, and some boldness. Yeah. And... So they gathered around him, anointed him with oil and began to pray. And while they were praying, the cancer fell off Johnston's lip onto the floor and he lived to be 92 years old. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Why don't we stand together just to stretch and come back into the mode of worship and seeking the Lord here today. Are any of you going through hardships? You should pray. Is God doing something good in life? You should praise. Are you sick? You should come and be prayed for, anointed with oil. If you need to confess sins today, please do it before the Lord. He's listening to you. Jesus is the great high priest. He's your mediator. You can go to him. If there's someone in the room that you, know, you need to process with and pray with, someone you trust and love that could help you pray, Let's do that. I want to show you a video. There's a lot of really good context to this video. But this is a, a teacher, an elder, who had gotten the flu in the 90s and it had destroyed his voice. And for three years, he could not teach the way he wanted to teach and preach. He had to resign his position as a pastor. And actually the day before this, and this might rock you a little bit when I say this, but just so you know, even pastors are human, okay? But he was ready to take his life for four hours in his house. And then the next day he had to teach and he should have called himself off and not done it, but he decided to do it. And he goes to teach and you can hear his voice for a moment in this video and then you can hear what God does. Are you ready? Check this out. On the other hand, to say that, since we don't have anything after the book of Acts, that miracles ended at the book of Acts and they never happen again is equally as wrong. Because you have put God in the box both ways and he doesn't want to be in the box. So the psalmist says, I'm excited. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. One of his benefits is he heals all of my diseases. And in verse 4 he says, And he redeems my life from the pit. Now I like that verse just a whole lot. I have had and you have had in times past pit experiences. We've both had We've all had times when our life seemed to be in a pit, in a grave. And we didn't have an answer for the pit we find ourselves in. And I don't understand this right now. I'm but overwhelmed at the moment. I'm 
not quite sure what to say or do. <laughs> I'm uh, Sounds funny to say at a loss for words. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. I He redeems my life from the pit. <laughs> And crowns me with love and compassion. Yes, Lord. Thank you, God. He satisfies my desires with good things. Thank you, God. So that my youth is renewed like the eagles. Yes, Lord. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all the oppressed. Thank you, Jesus. The Lord is compassionate and gracious. The Lord is slow to anger. The Lord is abounding in love. Yes, God. The Lord will not accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve, that's mercy. Or repay us according to our iniquities, that's mercy. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, Thank you, God. so great is his love for those who fear him. Thank you, God. As far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us. Thank you, Jesus. Praise the Lord. Amen. God is good. God is good. I want to encourage our faith today, encourage you. And we're going to have our prayer team members come down. And if you want just space away, you can just to be with the Lord. But our prayer team, our elders are going to come down. We're going to just pray over you if you need healing. For anything, we're going to worship as well. And so come with faith and let's pray together with faith and let God do what he does. Amen. We offer faith. We offer a prayer of faith and we let God take care of the outcome. Simple as that. Lord, we, we, we come here, Lord, seeing your word and seeing what you do. We want to praise you today. We want to worship you. God, we come to you if we are sick, as your word says. Lord, and we ask, Lord, by faith, through faith, through the power of Jesus Christ, you would heal our bodies. Do what you want to do today. We love you, God. In Jesus' name, amen.